Hello, and welcome to Jason Cabinet's Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cabinet. Our guest today is Melanie Waller. Melanie, are you, ready, are you ready to be great today? I am ready, Jason. Melanie is a medical visionary with paradigm shifting process to access genius health and flow in your body and business using the vagus nerve as a portal to health, growth, and success. Hold on. Sorry about that. Melanie brings over 25 years of experience to her leading edge systems, where she leverages Vegas nerve principles for visionary development, performance enhancement, and fine tuning genius. She's a physical therapist, board certified orthopedic clinical specialist, certified athletic trainer, and certified exercise expert for aging adults. And she's co authored and she has co authored a sleep course for continuing edu education credits for the American Physical Therapy Association. Melanie, you got a lot going on. Thanks for being here today. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me here, Jason. So what do you, what's keeping you busy right now? What's, what do you focus on right now? Oh, right now I'm creating a media and teaching platform for my work. That's my, my biggest new thing to try and get my message out on a bigger scale. So like, so basically you're doing like a content platform? Yes. So it's gonna be like blogs, videos, the whole nine yards. The the whole nine yards, yes, and uh, extra podcasts and meditation and guest speakers and a, a wide wide range. The world needs more Renaissance people. It needs more polymaths, more multi dimensional thinkers, and that's what. Uh, uh, part of what I really love helping to develop. The world needs more geniuses. And I love how my favorite thing about my work, which I wouldn't have expected it going in this direction years ago, but with my clients, it's so fun to watch how their genius and their magic opens up with it. So building this new content platform, how to imagine is both scary and exciting, right? Oh, absolutely. It's terrifying. Like, I don't know if anybody will join. <laughs> It's like I'm announcing it full uh, officially this weekend and into next week. So it's not even, you know, as we're talking, I'm just on the cusp of putting it out there. Um, but I've been putting, I'm, uh, you know, through doing lots of podcasts and lots of teaching and, you know, I'm very comfortable now articulating what I'm doing. And I've gotten to a place with my own work where uh, I feel like I don't need to hide the magic or hide the secrets. I have a lot of credentials through my, my professional association. And I, for years, I used the credentials to justify my existence. Basically, you know, that they were some, uh, you know, that they somehow, that they gave me more validity or like a, you know, a leg to stand on and how I work, but there's so much more. What I've loved for the entire course of my career is really tapping into the stress related and spiritual underpinnings of our physical dysfunction. You know, I never quite outgrew my three or four year old that wants to know why all the time. And so as you really dig into the why you can say that somebody you know hurt their back when they bent over to pick something up but there's always a deeper story there and a deeper level of stress and uh, uh a bigger pattern at play and i really loved digging deep into it and really getting to the root of it so that this pattern can stop i spent most of my career working with people that were frequent flyers in the medical system, that they repeatedly injured one part of their body or they had a condition that nobody else was able to help them with. And so doing the superficial stuff or, or you know, just being, I'll say techniques by themselves got boring really quickly. 
because you have to look at these people really like a whole person. They don't get better unless you start to zoom out to the 60,000 foot view. And from doing that over and over and over and just really playing with how, uh, what one or two things could I do, whether that was essentially a mindset shift or a body shift or a combination of all of that to start to unravel 10, 20 or 30 things for them became my my drug of choice. I just got so it was so fun to see what started to really open people up. And the vagus nerve was just such an amazing catalyst for that to happen. I think the vagus nerve connects us both within ourselves and without and around ourselves. And so it's got some really beautiful, the research around it is amazing. And I'll go into, into some of that, but my interest in treating the vagus nerve as a pinch nerve really started with some training I had early in my career and with a technique involving decompressing it at the base of the skull. And if I had somebody, for example, with knee pain or foot pain that wasn't getting better, I could decompress the vagus nerve at the base of their skull and their knee pain and their foot pain would go away. And it would change the whole way that they were moving. And over the years, I've built this out and developed it and really uh, have this much bigger understanding of how literally the head bones connected to the foot bone and how you can make, uh, you know, and how to create change on a systemic level. Medicine does an amazing job on many levels. It is great for acute care situations. When your heart stops, they restart your heart. When you break a leg, they set your bones. Medicine is not as successful with chronic conditions. And that's where I think that uh, this work and this thought process that I've put together really has a lot of power to keep people from cycling through these chronic, ongoing, long-term situations. So Melanie, with that, I want to do do, do a deeper dive on the vagus nerve, but let's go back to the four-year-old kids for a minute. Sure. So for your kids, kids in general, they take on life, you know, you know, curiosity, amazement, you know, they take all things in with the open heart, open mind. Why do you think this changes if we get adults, right? Is it societal pressures, parent, people telling us what to do, nor not to do? Like, why do we lose this, you know, gift that we have as a kid, do you think? Yeah, I think, I, I think it is a lot of societal and cultural pressures. I think this I think seeing your children as your greatest teachers, we're, we're so dismissive of children because they don't have experience and they don't have wisdom. But, you know, then we have other expressions like out of the mouths of babes, you know, that sometimes the deepest truths, <laughs> you know, that children make it, you know, hit us with the uh, the simplest and most eloquent facts as well. And I think that really understanding that there's a relationship there, that we're not there to uh, or I'll say for at least as much as we're there to help guide and shape our children, that our children are there to help guide and shape us. And I've tried to parent from that perspective, and it's certainly not always, always easy. And I think that children really show us how much, uh, you know, how much magic and power there can be in the world and in being your most authentic self, children are overwhelmingly uninhibited. And I really learned, uh, you know, as somebody who's been mass masterful at suppressing her authentic self for most of her life, it's, you know, I think a lot of this work, you know, and a lot of everybody's journey is to really get back to that sort of childlike wonder with life. And I think that we, you know, we just learn to be dismissive of things that seem magical, even when they have good scientific explanations. And I think that being living, uh, like my work never fails to uh, 
to amaze me. Like every, even when I know it's going to work, it still amazes me and thrills me every single time somebody gets a shift out of it. And, um, and I'm very fortunate to be able to, to do something that brings, uh, that feeds my soul at that level. But yeah, I think it is a culture, you know, I, a, a cultural and societal thing, but I think that we have to really honor our children as our teachers, as much as we are their teachers. Melanie, here are the time people say, you know, I'm going to help you find your personal zone of genius. I want to find my personal zone of genius award to that effect. What, what does that even mean? What, what, what's a zone of genius? Well, I think that we, I think your, your zone of genius is when you are able to connect the dots and things that were, that might seem unrelated. When you have disparate areas that you're able to bring together into oneness. And I think we live this out on a, uh, on a very big scale and that we can use things like mythology to really help us understand this. So I'll like, so I'm going to give a little st story for how about coming into your, uh, coming into the zone of genius. So in the ancient Egyptian myth of Isis and Osiris, Osiris was the king of Egypt and his brother Set was jealous and angry and wanted to be king. And so Set tricked Osiris into laying down in a bejeweled coffin, had his soldiers nail it shut and carry it to the Nile River to send him downstream to his death. Osiris's wife found out about that. She went and retrieved his body, took him back to a cave and breathed new life back into him. Set found out about that and was furious and he tracked down Osiris and chopped his body into pieces and scattered the pieces down the Nile River. Isis again went and picked up all of Osiris's pieces, took him back to the cave, put him back together and brought him to life long enough for them to conceive their divine child Horus. And then Osiris went on to be king of the underworld, which for the Egyptians was where all life came from and all treasures were found. And we use dismemberment metaphors in our language all the time. We say we're falling apart, we can't get it together, our hearts are broken, our lives are shattered. And when I imagine being in that story, everybody probably, except for Osiris's brother and his soldiers, probably thought that Osiris's destiny was to be the king of Egypt. His Yet his true destiny was to be the king of the underworld. And he literally had to come apart to come back together in a new way. Those disparate pieces had to come back together in a new form. And that's really metaphorical for tapping into your zone of zone of genius. When you're able to connect dots and connect and uh, identify relationships in ways that you previously were unable to, that brings you back into wholeness and brings you into your fullest power and not the destiny that everybody else thought you should have, but the one that's most true to your deepest self, to your soul. Melanie, can only you say you're new zonal genius or, or can another person say that you're new zonal genius? Like who, who decides that you need a zone of genius? Oh, that's so a good question. I think that, well, I'll say one, I think maybe that's not an either or question. I think that that can be both. I think that zone of genius is, uh, part of it is definitely tapping into flow state, which does have some psychological and physiological definitions to it, and at least being able to access that state, even if you're not always fully in it. I think that, um, I think that your zone of genius is definitely most deeply experienced by you most of the time, but it's also how you you know, I would say that, uh, like my clients get to experience my zone of genius 
too. Or like, you know, I had somebody tell me the other day, she's like, I don't know what you're doing, but it is really working. <laughs> and so I think that it can, uh, yeah, I don't think that's necessarily an either or question. And in the best case scenario, we all come together in our zone of genius to make something even better. I think it's a great space for collaboration. Melanie, um, recently, or maybe it was a while ago, you wrote a blog post on um, the source of all limitations or the source of your, limit, your limitations. Can you talk about that? Do you remember that blog post? Sure. So to me, the source of all limitations is resisting your own expansion in an ever expanding universe. And our bodies so closely mimic the cosmos and have such similar um, I'll say geometry and archetypal relationships that for me, alignment is really alignment, really true alignment really happens on a much bigger scale than within our bodies. When I first had the, uh, the realization about how resisting our own expansion in an ever expanding universe was the source of all limitations. My children were in middle school and I live in New Orleans and I was driving them past the Jefferson Davis statue twice a day. Or I was driving past it four times a day while uh, uh, in the process of when those statues were being taken down here or when Confederate statues were being taken down and when there were protests. And I wish I had stopped and taken photos of the protesters that were there during the day because it was really fascinating. I, outside of a hospital, I have probably not ever seen so many canes, walkers, wheelchairs, motorized scooters and oxygen tanks in one place. It was clearly a very, uh, it was a group of people with a lot of health conditions for sure, just based on the external support that they required. And I found it really fascinating to think about the density of a statue and how it doesn't move and how solid it is and how it doesn't expand compared to the difficulty that the protesters were having in thinking about uh, having a different relationship with our history. Sorry. And, oh, go ahead. No, you go ahead. I'm sorry. No, and the fact is our universe, our cosmos is ever expanding. And I think that, you know, you can take this into a lot of different directions. I think that weight gain can be one strategy to expand you expand physically you know when maybe you're struggling to expand more spiritually or to step into a bigger uh step into yourself in a bigger way and i think that when we dig our heels in or like puppies that don't want to go for a walk or <laughs> saying no i want my life to be stable i want it to be familiar and that's and we are fundamentally wired for what's right for or we are fundamentally wired for what's familiar for us, not what's right. So for example, that's why uh, abused women go back to their abusers because it's familiar. They know it's not right, but it's familiar. We repeat patterns it, that, uh, we, you know, we repeat the patterns of our parents and our grandparents, things like that, because it's familiar, not because it's in our best interest. Melanie, so how does one find like align their life correctly? Like, is it something that just happens by chance? Is it something you're gonna work on? Like, how does someone find alignment within their life? Well, I, for me, I help people open that up through their physical bodies, so then it can come through in, in more ways. Because I think our bodies, or I'll say, I know our bodies are always giving us signals and giving us messages. And when you can take your everything from your health conditions or your aches and pains or just your emotions and the way that you experience your emotions in your body and start to put 
meaning to them, you can really start to decode life in a way that opens up um, really big potential. I think, so medically we know that stress is 75 to 90% of all illness and disease and pain, yet we don't define very specifically what stress is. You know, well, like we know, like you can measure the vagus nerve through heart rate variability and you can talk about stress that way. You can talk about stress through the relationship of the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system, which, and your vagus nerve is the biggest component of your parasympathetic nervous system. You, um, but on a bigger scale, I'll say that like when your heroics and your desires are at odds with each other, that will show up as head or neck issues and it impairs your vision and it can show up quite literally as headaches and neck pain in that way and it also can show up as just your inability to have a bigger vision for yourself when you're stuck in being the hero in someone else's story and you're stuck satisfying everybody else's desires all at the expense of your own when you're being the rescuer for example for one or more people in your life versus uh being your own lifeguard. And those issues will very specifically manifest in the head and neck. And so it, and the reason that I believe that that happens is when you look at mythology through, when you look at mythology as a mode of communicating scientific information, I think that uh, that this all becomes really clear. So the Egyptian myth of Isis and Osiris that I mentioned earlier contains the numbers of the Earth's processional cycle. So it was a way they communicated about science. And the story of Aries in, astro in astrology, Aries rules the head and the ventricles in the brain that make cerebral spinal fluid look just like the ram's horns that represent Aries. And in astrology, Taurus rules the throat and the way the hyoid bone in the throat sits on top of the larynx looks just like the symbol for Taurus. So, and though that's your heroics and your desires, your Aries versus your Taurus, and it will literally compress your vagus nerve at the base of your skull on a very physical level and you can go to somebody and get a technique or to you know get some sessions done to help open up that space but if you're not going to if you don't repattern your life you know or repattern your thinking and think about how to uh you know what's really at the root of all of this you're very likely to end up back in somebody's office needing treatment again and so when we, uh, so when I think about how to expand or, or to stop resisting our own expansion, that it's like, you know, there are very specific issues that we can really look at this very clinically and start to see where the, um, you know, the physical expression of these patterns. So Melly, you talk about the cosmos. Can you explain to us in better detail, like how can like something a thousand miles, a thousand miles away affect us here on earth? Sure. Well, there's actually research that shows that when solar and space weather disrupts the electromagnetic field of the earth, it's measurable in our vagus nerves. And our vagus nerves innervates, uh, innervate our hearts, which makes up the, and our hearts create the strongest electromagnetic field in our bodies. And cardiac cells synchronize. When you put cardiac cells beating at different rates in a Petri dish together, they will all start to beat at the same rate. When you put people in a room together, they start to synchronize together. And so this research that's out about how uh, 
solar and space weather disruptions become measurable in our vagus nerves, I think is really exciting and gives us clues, you know, gives us some validity to how we really are related to the to the bigger picture. And I think gives a potential mechanism then for further study on how uh, astrology, like, you know, how planetary aspects and different things affect us as well, that it's, you know, maybe not just the solar and space weather. And the most interesting part of that research beyond the fact that it even happens in the first place is that the how disruptive it is depends on the strength of your interpersonal connections. So having good relationships, having good friendships, having being really solid in who you are and knowing that you're supported is really important to not getting blown about. And I would say that a big portion of what I do is helping people get electromagnetically strong so that they're not blown about so much. I don't have the research to yet to say that for sure, but that's definitely my, uh, my sense about it. So Melly, all the stuff that you know, you learned, how do you learn this? Do you have a degree in something or like just research? So like, how did this all come about? Oh, well, it all came about in the throes of my own midlife crisis. And well, I've had, I mean, I've, I have my master's degree in physical therapy and I, when, uh, and I, uh, like about 10 years ago, ended up in a space where my life was falling apart. My body was falling apart. My marriage was struggling and I had a professional lawsuit brought against me and I branded myself as the stress management expert and you know, and here I was in the throes of my whole life falling apart. And it was not amusing in the least at the time. And um, the uh, so I, I scaled back a little bit. And one of my struggles that I had been well aware of was reconciling my collection of letters after my name, like my credentials and just my, you know, and coming out of, you know, a more allopathic medicine type uh, training to uh, to my soft skills, to, you know, to my more intuitive skills and to, because my patients would tell you um, that they they like that I have lots of credentials, but they really come to me much more for my intuitive thought skills and my ability to put things together. They like understanding this stress that's driving what's happening. And my, I have been trained for most of my career in very, very gentle techniques. So it doesn't always feel like I'm not always touching people very hard when I'm doing the releases on them. And, you know, and now I work with people online and that's some, it's like, and I love being able to create change in that space as well. And so I was kind of, you know, I sort of had this, like a little bit of like a multiple personality disorder <laughs> situation with my business where I had these, uh, you know, I could, you know, I could talk about things from the same thing from two sides, like I could talk about it very logically, you know, through structure and function and physiology, and I could talk about it through um, uh, more through those spiritual underpinnings. And some of that was related to just some self study that I had done with chakras and, and other reading. And but when I scaled back to kind of figure out how I really wanted to show up, I, uh, I did some other reading and that's where I learned about mythology being a mode of talking about science. And so then my first thought with that was, oh, well, the earth right now is at about a 23 and a half degree tilt, tilt. what's 23 and a half degrees from the midline of the body. And when I pulled out my anatomy books and my protractor, and I've had the chance to see real skulls since where your vagus nerve exits the base of your skull is 23 and a half degrees from the center of where your spinal cord 
exits the base of the skull. And I know just through my biomechanical training that normal rotation between your first and second cervical vertebrae is 47 degrees to each side. And I learned there were 47 degrees between the pole stars that the earth points towards over thousands of years. And the anterior cruciate ligament in the knee sits at an average 47 degree angle of inclination and normal rotation at the foot is 23 degrees. And so I have, like I had a large collection of angles that I could match with those numbers in the Isis Osiris story in, you know, and certainly with the, um, just where the uh, tilt of the earth is now. And I recognized from working with people that had not found success in other places that these, these areas were, they were angles that I treated all the time where I found dysfunction all the time. And so what, so this is, uh, I suppose I, I suppose I am writing the book on this at the moment in, in t- terms of theory and, and collecting data that we have these critical angles in the body. And if these, these angles in our body that are most close to angles of the earth's processional cycle are not right, then we are more likely to have discomfort in our life one way or the other. The next piece that came to me um and i don't know can i share my screen um yeah hold on here is the uh i have okay i have a favorite image of uh this is my favorite anatomical picture of anything ever and i've showed it to patients for over 20 years so it's a picture it's a compilation of mri images that give you a 3D picture of what the ventricles in the brain look like. And the ventricles make cerebral spinal fluid. And I taught a class a number of years ago and ended up talking about the ventricles. And afterwards I thought, oh, I'll put this picture up on my, from my anatomy book up on social media. And at that point, and I had been studying astrology for myself just to figure out what was happening with me and, you know, with everything falling apart. And what really struck me the next time I opened that up was how much this looks like the astrological symbol for Aries. And in astrology, Aries rules the head. So it would make sense to have this, uh, you know, or say at the time it made incredible sense to me that because I've been, it was in this space of looking at mythology as a mode of scientific storytelling. It's just a way that they, they just told their science differently. And so then I was like, oh, well, where's the rest of it? I was super curious. And sure enough, it works this way the whole way through the body that the way the hyoid bone in the throat sits on top of the larynx looks just like the symbol for Taurus and Taurus rules the throat. Our kidneys sit in our low back, just like a set of scales. Uh, uh, Kidneys are ruled by Libra, which is represented by a sign of scales. And scales also mean justice. And in the United States, at least, the populations with the highest levels of social injustice also have the highest levels of kidney disease. So the stress of social justice really becomes embodied at the level of the kidneys. A woman's reproductive system looks very much like a scorpion, where the vagina is the tail and the ovaries are the claws, and Scorpio rules the reproductive system. And so these stories really tell the story of our own anatomy and physiology. We even have structures within our cells that are the same shape as the constellations. Adenosine triphosphate, which is the energy source made by the mitochondria in the cells is the same shape as the Aries constellation. And so, and it has similar archetypal function then as well. And so all of this really, what you know, for me, all of this really helps us have a much more intelligent and powerful and transformative discussion around stress and the we all have a physical expression of our internal narrative and an internal expression of our physical narrative and it's that rub between those places that causes 
really any kind of stress or dysfunction in the body. But we know through research that stress always affects the voice and the breath and our vocal cords and diaphragms are horizontally oriented in our body. And so the base of your skull is on a horizontal plane and your pelvic floor is on a horizontal plane. And there's several other points in there at well. And, and those hor when those horizontal structures get compressed, then the vertical thing pieces that go through them get pinched and you lose internal flow. And I contextualize a lot of this around the vagus nerve because I fundamentally believe the fastest way to get change in the body is to change the neural input. But you're also opening up more arterial flow and more venous flow and more lymphatic flow as you do it. And you it's very consistent with the Chinese medicine concept of qi in the where, how qi gets blocked in the body. And so you get more energetic flow too, as you open up these horizontal um, thresholds in the body. And it, uh, I've just found over the years in, in working with people, what I heard over and over was how what was happening inside of their body was so metaphoric for what was happening outside of their body. And, uh, you know, I would say that this whole, um, uh, you know, so no, I don't have a degree in astronomy or cosmology or anything like that, but I've been able, uh, but I believe that this, that, that coming apart, that having my physical body and my work and my marriage really struggle for a period of time allowed me to fall apart to a level that I couldn't come back together in the same way that I had to come back together in a new way. And that this is the work that I came here to bring forward to help people connect those dots. And it certainly put me in my zone of genius for a number of years. And I love sharing that with other people too. And it's really fun to see how, um, you know, to see business people that have people that have different expertise or engineers, or they have different expertise that as you get them aligned in this way, that it's like information drops in, like they're able to create in their life at a much deeper and much more powerful level. Melanie, so you covered like how parts of the human body, you know, pretty much look the same, almost like, you know, different places in, in, in the cosmos. Mm -hmm. Any chance is this by luck or coincidence or you think this is designed or just? I think it's 100% design. Like it's too, there's too much of it for it to be, coincidence. And I think fundamentally, the only rule we ever follow is as above, so below. That we can always look, you know, whatever's happening outside of ourselves, you know, is very metaphoric for what's happening uh, within ourselves, you know, and certainly, most ancient traditions teach that the answer is within. And I think that this is just putting some science to it. And I would love to create more research and create and inspire more research around this, because I think this is uh, just so fundamental to our existence. And the, you know, back from like Descartes is usually credited with separating the mundane world from the divine world, you know, the saying that, um, you know, our physical piece is the sum of everything. And, but we know deep down, most of us really know that we're so much more than that. And really having a unification process for the physical world and the divine world in a way that really gives you a language to bring them together is incredibly soothing to the nervous system. I, you know, I work with a lot of people or I have worked with a lot of people over the years with anxiety and depression and even some very severe mental health situations like hallucinations and, and suicide ideation too. And it's like, I, I, I struggle with the words to describe how profound creating transformation in those 
people, uh, how profound creating the transformation in those people is because it's, uh, you know, to take someone who was, uh, well, so I'll, I'll tell a story. I had somebody come into my office who, uh, had had an acute onset of hallucinations and he had sought help elsewhere and had not, uh, been, had been denied help or felt like he or felt like he wasn't, they weren't hearing him. And, the, you know, at the time, like, that's not my wheelhouse. That's not my, you know, I don't have, you know, I, at the time I had not knowingly helped somebody in that condition. And when, but he was in a bad place. Like it, when every, uh, everybody's faces were melting when he, he couldn't make eye contact because your face would start melting when he looked at it. And, and I certainly got him set up with, you know, I made sure that he, uh, I got him connected with people I knew who would listen to him and help him with the right psychiatrist and counselor and whatnot. But it was clear to me at the moment, in the moment that I couldn't turn him away either. And so I thought, okay, well, I'll decompress his vagus nerve, see if I can take the edge off of how he's feeling a little bit and send him on his, get him referred to the right people. And at the end of our session, and I did, you know, I did my vagus nerve decompression process on him. And at the end of our session, 90% of his hallucinations were gone. And he texted me later that night and he said, Melanie, you saved my life and not in the cute kind of way because I was planning to kill myself because this was so bad. And clearly the universe was conspiring to help him. And what I really learned out of that, because I did all of, used all of my technical skills, but I also brought all of my intuitive self skills to the table. I showed up fully there. I did not segment myself. I didn't say, oh, I'm just going to have my clinical hat on and, you know, not, um, you know, not bring my empathy, not bring, you know, these, uh, you know, not bring these other skills that I have. I showed up fully for him and and it was miraculous. And I think that that's really a lot, you know, that's part of what I love to teach is that when you show up fully for your clients and your patients you know, and for your life, that things become magical and miraculous very quickly. And I know now, like I've had, an, I've seen enough people in suicide ideation. I feel like I know exactly how it physically shows up in the body. And I'm looking for research partners now to take this out to a bigger scale because I know because it so severely locks up rotation in the body that I believe we can really use the body as a screening tool for mental health issues. And, you know, and that we can make this a very, very tangible, measurable science. So you, so you think that there's a way to look at somebody's body and tell if they're gonna uh, think about committing suicide? That'd be a, absolutely. That'd be a big breakthrough, I think. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we think about how the mind driving is driving the body, but we don't think very, you know, in the aggregate, like medicine doesn't really think about how the body will drive how the mind functions. And for all of the really great brain research that's out there, before a signal makes it to your brain, it comes in through your sensory system, it comes in through your electromagnetic field, it comes in through your vagus nerve, your vagus nerve gives way more information from your body up to your brain than it does from your brain down to your body. And so really looking at that, when you can give your brain good input, clear input, when it's got a good pathway for input, then it's able to give clear, healthy output as well. So Melanie, um, Elon Musk is trying to colonize Mars. Let's say he pulls it off. Are you going to be on the first trip to Mars? <laughs> oh, definitely not. I think Mario, I think that it's, I have, uh, 
I understand that drive for exploration and expansion. I also, um, you know, I think some things are better, uh, you know, if Mars was designed well for life, it would have lots of life on it, <laughs> it would have our life on it. I don't think we, I think we would be much uh, better served by focusing all those resources and all that brilliance for here on earth. Okay. Um, what's your favorite mythological story? Oh, by far Isis and Osiris just be, because I have so lived every character in that story. And I really, um, and I very much identify with Isis being the healer and the one who put everybody back together. And I identify with Osiris being the one who completely fell apart. And I identify with set where I've, uh, shut the lid on things or tried to, um, uh, blow up, you know, where I've been a difficult person to live with most certainly in some cases. And so I, um, uh, I, I find it a very, uh, a story that has endless nuance to it and that I can reread it over and over and get something different from it every single time. And it's such a, uh, such a universal story too. And pretty much each culture, each country has like the mythological stories, like the Greek myth, Roman myth, Egyptian myth. Like even, I think we have our, our, you know, like, you know, Don Johnny Appleseed, Paul Bunyan, like we all, every culture or demographic has a, has a, has a, like a mythology, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that we, you know, while, you know, I think that ancient myths are, are inherently star stories. And that's part of what we have, uh, you know, or they're like our relation, you know, our relationship between our bodies and the stars. I think that we write stories all the time that could be, that we could all, we could always relate them to the body. Uh, a while ago, somebody sent me a, it, it's a Sufi poem, which I believe was written in maybe the 1400s or 12, 1400s, somewhere in there. It's called the conference of the birds. And when I read it, I, I said, Oh, this is the, um, story of the pituitary gland and the hormones that are secreted from the pituitary gland. <laughs> and so like, I was able you know, like, I knew it instantly how it lived in the body when, uh, when I read it. And so I think that we can take a lot of stories and, um, uh, and look at them in this context. And I've taught theater students some of what I do as well, so that then they're able to go and uh, use what I've taught them to embody their character at a deeper level. So I think that this, like there are many, many applications for this work. And I think that it, we can absolutely take and apply it to modern, modern stories as well. So Melly, like mythological stories across different cultures, different countries, are they maybe not exactly the same, but do they have like a lot of coincidences among them? They do. That's, that has been my experience. Yes. And I think that as you, Uh, you know, and I think part of the process of, you know, in a spiritual tradition, what you might call moving closer to God or getting closer to source involves moving up the ancestral mythological tree that like where I think we've, uh, like the Isis Osiris story is very relatable that moving up to the story of their parents, Nut and Geb is the next one. And that Shu and Tefnut is the original divine masculine feminine split. And I think as we go, especially as you go older and like, look at the, the ancestral aspects of stories that it it takes you to that 
to that place of more clarity and purpose and depth within yourself. Melanie, Nick, can you talk about the importance of sleep? Oh, sleep is important for everything. <laughs> and it's certainly, uh, you know, sleep is imp important for mental health. It's important for physical health. It um, is certainly a way that we uh, um, process toxins and um, uh, our clean out our, uh, what's called your glymphatic system, which is kind of like the lymphatic system of the brain. And yeah, if you're not sleep is sleep is fundamental to absolutely everything. And I'll say beyond that, how your breathing is fundamental to sleep. And so when people have abnormal breathing patterns or they have vagus nerve compression at the level of the diaphragm or within the chest cavity or within their cranium that it can absolutely alter their ability to access sleep sleep um is important for driving it's important for athletic performance it's important for injury prevention there are um you know, and we are overwhelmingly lacking in sleep, you know, like lack of sleep is a huge issue or insomnia, difficulty going to sleep, difficulty staying asleep is a huge, uh, you know, it's culturally a very common complaint, certainly in Western society, but, you know, I see it in my practice as well. And I think having a more um, you know, sometimes you can't shut down your, when you can't shut down your mind, you're not having the conversation with your body about what's happening or that there's blockages in that, in the flow within your body that are keeping you from being able to get to sleep. One of the, I have my clients tell me all the time that the exercises I give them, help them get to sleep and they sleep, they always sleep especially well after a session with me, but it does help with that long-term uh, process of normalizing sleep. And when, you know, there's lots of great, um, you know, there's different great tips and tricks and stuff out there for facilitating sleep. But if you're, uh, if you're not sleeping because you're storing, you know, your body is storing an emotion or an experience and you're not able to, or compressing a nerve for that matter, and you're not able to uh, soothe that, all of the tips and tricks and uh, can be, um, I find sometimes have lackluster effects that it's really more about how you're, there's an aspect of it that's much more about what, how you're being than what you're doing. And one of the questions I ask my clients all the time is like, is filling your cup draining you? Cause I get smart clients, like they know how to do lots of things. They're busy, busy, busy collecting uh, information, but then they've got this gigantic toolbox and there's too many choices to use and they could exhaust themselves doing all sorts of techniques. So there's, so I have a very different approach to how I, um, help people sleep, but I certainly use, um, you know, encourage people to use all the good evidence that's out there in terms of, uh, minimizing their exposure to their phone in the time before bedtime or to, you know, blue lights in general. And, um, uh, but I think we're, we're all, you know, I spend time kind of helping people, um, really learn to have that conversation with their bodies. So like, if they're not sleeping, like to do a little body scan, feel where they're stuck and 
and to learn how to unstick themselves, both through uh, the specific way that I teach vagus nerve decompression and some other ways as well. Melanie, like some people, their, their sweet spot is eight hours of sleep per night, some are six, some, you know, a little mm -hmm. is four. Why do all of us have like different sweet spots as far as the hours we need for sleep? Oh, that's a good question. I don't know. Uh, I suppose I don't have a really clear answer to that. I, I, I fundamentally believe the answer to that lies a little bit more in our astrological makeup than it real than it lies in our um, physiological makeup. That there's an archetypal aspect of that for sure. And I think that when we're, you know, for people that are sleeping five or six hours a night, I find that sometimes they're not, um, they're not getting the right kind of energetic nourishment in their lives, or they're not exhausting themselves physically. Like sometimes those people like literally need much more intense physical movement so that by the time they go to bed, they're more exhausted. Sometimes, uh, you know, and this is where I find bringing in a little bit of the astrology is really helpful. Like if, um, like if you have a seventh house moon and your moon in indicates how you, uh, ideally nourish yourself and seventh house and so an astrology chart is divided up into 12 slices of the pie. And if you have a seventh house moon, which is partnership and you're sleeping alone, sometimes that can be a little, you know, that can create a little bit of tension. And so you have to have kind of this ritual around um, connecting with the partnership that you do have in your life, whether that's business or uh, personal and creating some nighttime rituals that help soothe the partnership aspect of yourself so that you don't go to a sleep so you're not sleeping you're not perceiving that you're sleeping completely alone you know or that you're completely alone in your life i think that's where that gets hung up and i know that's a very big abstract kind of thought but it ends up being very effective in terms of getting people to uh to sleep better because they because it taps into these deeper truths that they know about themselves like you know that really and takes away a certain level of the anxiety because they whether they sometimes they realize it and sometimes they don't that they're just really somebody in that situation can be very loneliness focused when they don't need to be and so i think that like the sleep science is great and if you haven't read Mar uh matthew walker's book why we sleep i think that should that's required reading for being human and that everybody should absolutely read it um but i think that there's more uh you know there's more to the story and that's what i'm always picking apart and i think that even our uh you know sometimes we sleep that our archetypal makeup can drive our sleep patterns too Melanie, is sleep debt a real thing? If it is, how do how do, can someone like catch up on the sleep debt? My understanding is that yes, it is a real thing. And I think that, you know, this is where our society doesn't really help us so much. I mean, it's nice, like if you have your own business or, you know, certainly, a, a, you know, are able to create a flexible schedule that like being able to take a little nap in the middle of the day is a great way to catch up on sleep debt. And there, the research shows that when people are able to take a nap in the middle of the day at work, that they are so much more productive, <laughs> but very few companies encourage or make the space for that to happen. And so this is where we need some, I think some big cultural shifts on what we expect of each other in an eight hour workday research shows there's only three hours of productivity anyway <laughs> and so the fact that we're we're working eight hours is its own uh you know perhaps crazy making 
kind of thing. And, you know, because we, you know, in our modern age, we've got electricity, you know, we're the only species that can disrupt our own circadian rhythms by making it seem like the sun is still up when it's not, you know, being able to like going out and watching the sunrise and watching the sunset or being outside of those hours can be very good for your circadian rhythms and getting, you know, overcoming sleep debt is a lot of, uh, getting your body into more of a, into more of a routine and getting it in line, getting it in line with the cycles of the earth. Melanie, so, you know, there's mental health and physical health. Shouldn't it just be health period or should mental health actually be divided like they are? Oh, I think they are exactly the same thing. I absolutely, I do not think it should be divided. I think your mental health is expressed in your physical body and that we are not recognizing that on a big scale. I think it should absolutely just be, just be health. Melanie, can you talk more about your background and how you became a physical therapist? Sure. So I was, uh, I majored in athletic training in college, undergraduate, and I did that because I, uh, I guess for two reasons. One, I wanted a marketable skill when I graduated. I ended up marrying the, uh, my high school and college sweetheart. So I, and he was in, uh, he was at the Naval Academy. And so I knew I needed something that I could move <laughs> with that would move with me, a skill set that would move with me as we moved around the world. And so, uh, and I thought that it would be fun. Like that was really fun to me. I had been a competitive swimmer and wasn't quite fast enough to compete really easily at the level where I went to college undergrad. And so um, athletic training kept me in that world a little bit. And particularly 25 years or, you know, or going on, uh, 30 years ago. Now the, there were not the, there were not really jobs for women in athletic training at the university level, or it was very, and at the professional level, most certainly, and the jobs that were available were more like graduate internships and things like that. They weren't very highly paying. And so, uh, and all of my mentors had been physical therapists. So they all really encouraged me to go to physical therapy school. And so I did that at the University of Southern California. And it was the absolute best education, I think, that uh, I think my class got potentially like the best PT education of anybody in all of history <laughs> because we were there the USC was the second, we were the last master's class there. And USC was the second program in the nation to switch to a doctorate program. And so we had all of the most amazing clinicians in Los Angeles as our teaching assistants, because they were all there getting their transitional doctorate degrees while we were students. So I am have been grateful every day for my education and that we ha had these amazing clinical instructors, uh, and, and professors that really helped us look at people head to toe. I, you know, I, I really received an amazing education fundamentally and understanding how to use my orthopedic skills on neuro patients and use my neuro skills on orthopedic patients. And, um, and that just really got, uh, drilled into us very, very heavily. And so I ended up, uh, I, well, I did a variety of, worked in a variety of settings when I first <clears throat> graduated, including hospital based, both, um, acute care and rehab, which was spinal cord injuries and brain injuries and strokes. And <clears throat> but, you know, with my athletic training background, you know, I really like, I love outpatient orthopedic settings. That's definitely my, um, or always where I was, was happiest. And 
probably when I was two or three years out of school, I ended up, I just like, I didn't even seek it out. It just kind of, it, it, it actually came, uh, came to me, but I ended up working with someone who had a reputation in the local community for, uh, being amazing with chronic pain patients and people that no one who, that nobody else could solve. And so, and he was very generous. He used to treat his patients and my patients and the other therapist patients all or like he'd consult on everybody's cases. And we, uh, and, but it was so, so it was valuable in two ways. I'll say one, we ended up with this, in, like this huge caseload of patients that where we were completely routinely getting kicked out of the box for how we looked at the problem because these are people these are people that hadn't responded to conventional interventions and so like when like we had somebody with a with knee pain that wasn't getting better and we'd go to Rick and say Rick what you know like, I don't know what to do. And he would look at us and say, well, did you check their thoracal lumbar junction, which is the junction between like your middle and lower back and the spine? And, you know, we would be like, no, we didn't think about that. We didn't, you know, we did the ankle and we did the hip, but we didn't go all the way up to the thoracal lumbar junction. And so we just, it was really helpful to have somebody to guide you as you were continually getting kicked out of the box and to help just, you know, expand and expand and expand my thought process and my skill set. And, uh, you know, and then as I moved on, the it didn't matter where I, you know, everywhere I lived, even if I, though I was mostly in an outpatient orthopedic setting, as we moved around, like literally around the world, people who, you know, those people that nobody else could figure out would come, like they found me, you know, I, you know, and I very quickly got a reputation for that in, in very different pl places. I recognize that my love of um, the vagus nerve and learning about that through some continuing education courses, which included uh, some of the, which were at Michigan State University's College of Osteopathic Medicine, was really, um, you know, I think we're all, we all fundamentally do the thing we need most to heal ourselves. And that my work with the vagus nerve is fundamentally about me figuring out my own vagus nerve. <laughs> and its limitations too. I recognize where that's been uh, a big thing in my uh, mental health journey has come a long, long way. And I know that, and um, I fully recognize how my work with the vagus nerve has really uh, helped me see myself in a bigger light. Um, and there's some, uh, I recently just found some research about how your uh, vagus nerve gives uh uh better like more clarity in your mind's eye basically is what the research said uh but it's absolutely transformed um my mental health and my physical health i'm turning 50 next week and um you know and i feel great i don't have physical pain i'm can do all the things that I want to do. And when, uh, you know, I get a, uh, if something throws a wrench in it, I'm able to really un untangle it and quite quickly. So Melanie, let's say someone's about to go to physical therapy. What, what is a goal of physical therapy? Is that to completely get rid of the pain, make the pain manageable or, or it just depends on the situation? Well, that depends on the situation. Yeah, I have a, my goal. I expect everybody that comes to see me to see me to be better in one visit. It doesn't always happen, but it happens just often enough that I believe it's always possible. <laughs> and so, I find three visits is a really nice uh, number. I find to really get everything to stick. Sometimes people uh, <clears throat> they leave after the first session a little bit with their heads spinning or it's, it can be a very emotional ex experience and it works this way online too, because the difference between acute subacute pain and chronic pain, and I would extend this to chronic beliefs as well, is that chronic pain gets locked into our limbic systems, which is where our emotions are. And you cannot logic yourself out of your limbic system. You need an emotional key to unlock it from there. So I, 
and I will find the vagus nerve decompression process alone very often makes people cry. Like I've said for years and years that I'm really good at making people cry, <laughs> you know, and not, you know, through being mean or anything like that, but it just, you know, like it opens up. And I think the process of being seen, because I see so many people who have had ongoing things and then they don't. Um, and when I validate it, I'm like, yeah, I completely understand why you haven't been feeling good or why this has been going on. You know, when I validate that, that's such a huge relief because they felt so unseen for such a long time that that can give an emotional response. Though my favorite response, uh, which doesn't doesn't happen quite as quite as often, but is, uh, and this is usually usually happens when I see someone in person that they get up from the table and at first they're a little confused about where their pain went. Like they're looking around for it because they can't believe that it <laughs> uh, that it was that easy to get up off the table, and then they're angry because it took so long for to get this figured out and they don't think it should have been that easy to solve and all of the leading pain science experts i learned this probably like five or six years ago and it made me really happy to 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 know this they get really excited when somebody cries or gets angry when they explain pain to them because then they know they're going to get better it's the people with a flat affect that they worry about melanie what is a vagus nerve or why is it so important so your vagus nerve is your 10th cranial nerve and we have 12 nerves that come out of our brain stem that's all a cranial nerve is it means it starts in your brain stem and your vagus nerve goes all the way from your brain stem down to your pelvis and i'm just going to I'm going to say a lot of things right now, but it's still just skimming the surface of what the vagus nerve does because it does so much. It exits the base of your, as it exits the base of your skull, it goes down towards your heart and loops back up to innervate your vocal cords. So I like to think of it as the nerve that allows us to speak our hearts. It innervates our hearts, it innervates our digestive systems. We cannot absorb vitamin B12 without our vagus nerves. It is involved in digestive enzyme and bile secretion and in the muscles that move food through our digestive systems. As I said earlier, it gives more information to your brain than it does from your brain down to your body. So you can also think of it, it's your gut brain and it's your heart brain. It's those more instinctual experiences that we have. In women, the vagus nerve innervates the cervix. And in the research, they've shown that women with complete spinal cord injuries can achieve orgasm with vagus nerve stimulations and sexual arousal in general is a parasympathetic um, response, which is, you know, and your, and your vagus nerve is the biggest part of your parasympathetic nervous system. And so, uh, so your vagus nerve certainly is involved in pleasurable sensations. As a physical therapist, I was really, I really came to love it because it mediates inflammation. So the better your vagus nerve functions, the less inflammation you have. And in the research, they've sh shown that how well your vagus nerve function has predictive value for how long patients with pancreatic cancer will live because it's able to manage their, they're able to better manage their inflammation. So it actually improves their longevity. Uh, it, we all know when our vagus nerves are not functioning so well, Be, that's when we go to do public speaking or something that would make us similarly nervous, but public speaking is a great example. And we all know our fight and flight systems will often take over when we go to do something like that. And so when you get a lump in your throat and your palms sweat and your heart's racing and your stomach feels funny, those that all happens because your vagus nerve has been dialed down. And so your fight and flight system has been dialed up and is taking over. In the research, they will often use uh, apply vagus and uh, apply electrical stimulation to the vagus nerve. And there's research that shows electrical stimulation to the vagus nerve reverses the mitochondrial defects deep in the cells that go with heart disease. 
so your vagus nerve isn't directly in the mitochondria of the cells, but there's a cascade of events that when your vagus nerve is functioning well, that it can repair the mitochondrial abnormalities that go with uh, particularly it's ischemic heart disease, which ischemia is from lack of blood flow. When you pair vagus nerve stimulation with an auditory stimulus, it remaps your brain at the highest levels. You actually get more real estate in your, uh, in your brain for the, you get more auditory real estate when you pair it with an auditory stimulus and your vagus nerve is in all of your senses. It's it innervates some of your taste, it innervates the skin of your ear canals. They know that it's uh, involved in smell, though the mechanism, as far as I've read, they are not 100% clear on uh, how vagus nerve function affects pupillary dilation. So it's involved with your eyes as well. So, uh, so just connecting with your senses can be a very uh, vagus nerve soothing experience as well. It uses the same neurotransmitter that your muscles do, which is acetylcholine. So you get these really beautiful neuromuscular shifts. So you, you get beautiful increases in range of motion and flexibility and even strength with, uh, by working with the vagus nerve because the muscles end up in better, uh, in a better length tension relationship. So they're able to fire more effectively. Melanie, you talk about de decompressing the vagus nerve. How do you do, how does that work? What's the process for decompressing the vagus nerve? Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> I have a series of manual techniques that I use when I have people one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. I have uh, really easy breathing exercises in specific positions that I work with, use to work with people online or, um, and there's, if you go to embodyyourstar.com, you can sign up and it will actually send you two vagus nerve decompression courses. One, uh, it will email you the link to one and it'll uh, take you to a consolidated version. And the one it emails you is actually on my YouTube channel. So people can go check out the, uh, uh, my YouTube channel as well. And uh, for that long, there's an hour long vagus nerve course, and it teaches you how to assess, self assess, and then also treat. And so I could take you through, I could, I mean, I could describe a couple of, take you through a couple of, a little bit of assessment right now, if you yeah, I think that'd be like, good. would yeah. that be good? good? Yeah. Okay. All right. So, <clears throat> The one of the places that the vagus nerve gets compressed is at the back side of the heart. And so from a clinical standpoint, what will happen or what I will see is when I ask people to breathe uh, or ob observe their breathing as well, is that they will have, they'll be putting all of the air into their upper chest and the lower front ribs, and they won't be expanding their ribs on the backside at all. And this is a very common pattern in people that have anxiety. It's very common with shoulder and neck pain uh, patterns as well. And so one way that you can undo that is to, and if, for people that are listening, if you don't multitask while you do this, like give it your full attention. Uh, to cross your left ankle in front of your right and just to have a little bit of pressure between your ankles. And if you have any. Now, do you have to be standing up or sitting down? Or does that no, 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 I sit, no. Sitting down. I usually do teach these in sitting. Okay. <clears throat> you could do it. <clears throat> you, excuse me. Let me take a sip of water. You could do it in standing, but I don't <clears throat> typically do that. Just, uh, unless I'm really advancing somebody for a specific reason. 
But so yeah, just sitting down. And if you have any hesitation about doing this at all, the beautiful thing about our brains is that they don't see doing something and imagining doing something is any different. It's the same, uh, your same parts of your brain activate. So if you have uh, a knee or a shoulder or head injury, or head issue or anything that makes you hesitant to get into these positions, it's okay. Don't worry about it. Like you could literally just do the breathing and you'll get some of the benefit from it as well. Um, and certainly if you have a limitation in your shoulder or neck, you could, you know, like move your head and shoulders just to see how much motion you have. Like I'll have people turn their heads side to side and I'll also have them, uh, often, uh, turn their head and bring their ear down towards their chest. So turn as far as you comfortably can to one side. Like, so I'm a little tight over here today. This one's not so bad. All right. So that'll be my before <clears throat> and after you can also put a hand on the, uh, on your heart at the front and a hand on the back of your rib cage and just take a couple of deep breaths and feel if you're getting some expansion on the back side of your ribs or if you're only breathing or if you if only your front hand moves and you feel like your hand that's on the back side of your ribs maybe just below or at your shoulder blade level is moving so that's a couple just a little bit of assessment so then to fix it i like i love the fixing part so much so <laughs> it's jumped right past the assessment to start um <clears throat> but it's to cross your left ankle in front of your right and then take your right hand and put it on your left <clears throat> shoulder and take your left hand and put it comfortably in the small of your back. <clears throat> and then what you want to do is inhale into the space between your shoulder blades. So you're going to inhale into the back side of your heart, maybe a little bit off to the left and so I usually have people inhale for a count of five, hold for a count of eight, and then exhale for as long as they can, like they're blowing out a candle. So long, long, long exhale. And I'll ask if you're, if you are doing it right now, I'm going to ask you to do two more. So you've done at least three of them. And while I'm, uh, have them do this, I'll usually tell them about a South American proverb that says your future is behind you, propelling you forward. And your past is in front of you, <clears throat> waiting for you to make peace with it and clear your way. And so as you breathe into the backside of your heart, <clears throat> to imagine that you're breathing in to your future, that you're aligning yourself with the things that you want, your, that your future is not something that you have to go chasing in front of you, that the universe has your back, that you're supported, and to really feel into that support. And then you can go retest and see. Yeah. And I got a lot more movement out of that than I had before where I was blocked, but, um, it usually works, uh, works pretty quickly. And even, uh, that exercise can even unlock tight hip flexors and things much, uh, more distant in the body. It can change the way the kneecaps move. And so you might get get extra benefits that you didn't even realize. Millie, how often does someone do this? Like once a day, once a week, or just whenever they want? Well, for a specific issue, I will, I give people two choices if they have a specific issue ongoing, I will ask them to either do five sets of five breaths once a day, or to do five breaths, five sets of five breaths spread out throughout the day. I don't, my interest is more that they do it than they not do it. So I want it to fit into their lives. So I really work with people on that level in for maintenance. I, I think that doing 
one or two vagus nerve exercises a couple times a week is a great practice. They are also very useful when you zig when you should have zagged or you do something that you think, oh, I'm going to pay for that tomorrow. You helped a friend move their sofa or um, you just stepped off a curb and felt your back twinge or something like that. I find they're really, really useful for mitigating things from spiraling into something bigger, especially for on an orthopedic level. That breathing into the backside of the heart is really helpful for anxiety as well. And so the more you can uh, kind of like the more physical space you can give your heart, because a lot of people experience anxiety in their chest area around their heart space. If you give the heart more physical space and get your breath pattern to shift there, then the anxiety pattern will, will often shift because fundamentally most of us breathe too much with our upper chest and not enough with our diaphragms and not enough with our bellies, not enough with the backside. Like we're way too front centric with our breathing and way too high with our breathing. And when we're breathing, especially with our upper chest, those muscles, the, those neck muscles that attach to our upper ribs are only supposed to be used in forceful inhalations or in a fight and flight response. And so when you're constantly breathing with your upper chest, you are reinforcing the fight and flight response in your body. So getting your breath down and getting it back is very, very soothing to the nervous system. Melanie, so you would ever take your expertise and all, all you know about all, you know, the vagus nerve and other items we talked about into a pretty viable business. Can you talk about the process of, you know, deciding going to business for yourself and, and, and that, that entrepreneurial journey you're on right now? Sure. Yeah. The, uh, well, I basically went into business for myself because I was so frustrated at the limitations of the medical system. I was like, I know I can do this better and faster without these constraints. Cause in a traditional clinic, a lot of times in, a, and I worked in really clinics that were very generous with the amount of time they let you spend with a patient, but sometimes it was still only 15 minutes, sometimes 30. And when you have, for some people that's fine, but for some times you need, uh, you know, because I was seeing such a heavy caseload of people that had not had success in other places that was not like their answers were not super, super simple either. And I really like that relationship. And I learned a lot from, you know, when you talk to people, you really start to learn the, uh, like what's driving their stress and where those patterns in their life are showing up in their, in their bodies. And I initially started my business to really, cause I have a lot of formal training in tests that have predictive value for injury risk and function and really wanted to integrate this into uh, businesses to help them reduce their workers comp multipliers. <clears throat> and I had a really, really hard time uh, selling that. And when I finally just said, well, I have really good hands, I'll just keep doing, you know, do the manual stuff. Like then I got, you know, a huge flood of individual clients. So I stuck with that for a number of years. And so the last, um, <clears throat> certainly the last four or five years, I've, you know, my vision is to really step more into, or what I've been doing and is to step more into teaching and speaking and getting this message out and into research collaboration. And so I've been doing a lot more podcasts. I taught a round of last year, I taught a, a first round of certification in my process and uh, now am launching a content platform to be able to 
teach and interact and give people access to one-on-one -on -one, uh, to office hours with me and things like that and to uh, demonstrations, group demonstrations and group healing activities and, and uh, on how this work, how this works and to help clinicians integrate it into their practice, uh, whatever their license might be. I've taught um, physicians and hypnotherapists and physical therapists and uh, a number of nurses. And uh, so I've taught a range of skill sets. And so it's helpful, uh, you know, but they don't use this information the same way a physical therapist does. So it, uh, but I help people uh, figure that out. And that's really what I'm passionate about is educating and speaking it, uh, speaking about this. So my, um, you know, ultimately my goal is to really reduce the number of one-on-one, -on -one, you know, private one-on-one -on -one sessions that I'm doing, though I haven't, uh, cut that off yet. And to really, um, move, uh, do more teaching and speaking full time and, uh, Anyway, and it's an ongoing, you know, it's definitely, it's definitely an ongoing journey. And it's been my child as I was <clears throat> just struggling with my voice there for a few minutes, I'll say that my, my childhood trauma is very much about lost voice. And the, it's, you know, treating the vagus nerve at the level of the vocal cords is really the last frontier for me because speech pathologists always got the <clears throat> vocal dysfunction referrals. So I was not as experienced in that area of the body. And when, uh, you know, but I think this whole, uh, I, I say a number of years ago, I learned that lost voice was the karmic backstory of my astrology chart too. And so when I put that together with my childhood experience of not being allowed to sing and not being allowed to speak in certain situations and then uh, ending up specializing in the nerve that innervates the vocal cords. It all feels very much like I made it all happen and, and I can really allow those experiences in my childhood to sit in a place where I really appreciate them versus a place where I was angry about them, which I was in for a long, long time. Um, but certainly using my voice and getting my voice out there is uh, on a much bigger scale is my focus at the moment. Melanie, can you talk about some of the pros and cons of having your own company or being an entrepreneur? Oh, yeah. There's, I mean, I'm still at the point, I have a little bit of help right now, but like the doing it all thing, I really like is, is exhausting sometimes, you know, or like, and learning to to do what I'm good at and delegate the rest it has, uh, um, has been a challenge and sometimes delegating it hasn't been an option just financially because the amount of, you know, for whatever the, uh, help is, but like that strategic, like letting or that strategic expansion of letting go, you know, for growth, <laughs> you know, and, and learning that, you know, sometimes even when the <clears throat> profit margin is slimmer, that, that letting stepping into that expansion makes space for more profit, you know, is certainly, a um, a lesson I'm clearly learning and, you know, and an ongoing tug of war with my own, uh, my own inner being that I'm gradually getting better at. Um, you know, the beautiful part of it is that like, if I want to go on vacation, I just block it off, <laughs> you know, and I don't have to get my vacation approved <laughs> by anyway, if I need a mental health day for myself, that's, uh, not, it, it's not difficult to schedule. It's harder to follow through with it than it is to schedule. <laughs> it's like, you know, just because it's, I'm writing my book. And so, you know, if, when I have a down day, it's like, oh, I'm gonna, you know, get more of my book done. But I really get, uh, my work really nourishes me. And so I don't get, it's hard for me to get overworked. Melanie. Can you talk about some of the lessons you've learned so far? Oh, in, in business or in, yeah, yeah, in business? In business. Yeah. The, <clears throat> I, uh, 
the value of a, uh, I've certainly learned the value of a business plan <laughs> and the value of uh, really And I think the value of scaling, it took me a long time to figure out how I was going to scale my work in a way that felt authentic and meaningful and whatnot. And if you had asked me, you know, I talk about this content platform, it's been, you know, I've been calling it my media empire, but yes, it is a content platform is a much more practical way to, to, to say it. But if you had asked me, you know, even two years ago, if this is what I was going to be doing, I'd be like, no, 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 Media Empire is not my, <laughs> certainly isn't my thing. And so I, but I think letting the, um, the biggest lesson is for me is that I inherently think too small about myself and that to kind of keep holding this bigger vision and bigger vision about what's possible. <clears throat> has been really important but <clears throat> the big vision uh doesn't come into fruition without the incremental steps <clears throat> underneath it and so that's um uh you know and i think i've always been good at holding um like having this it's i don't have a even when i don't hold a big enough vision for myself i'm still like i'm very good at big picture thinking that part of it i get but those incremental steps that oh this is what needs to go first and second like i because i just would rather jump to the end point. And so really breaking things down into, uh, <clears throat> into steps and into language that, uh, you know, one of the biggest challenges of what I do is because I've been screaming Vegas nerve into the wind for, uh, 10 or 15 years, at least now to, uh, but getting it in language that people really understand has been a, um, a big lesson too into the language that makes makes others really under makes it meaningful to others you know when you live in your with your information in your head it doesn't make sense to you it doesn't always make sense to others or learning to tell like really it's it's been a lot of storytelling like learning to tell a story melanie i don't know if this is the right term but do you have to like have malpractice insurance to, to protect yourself from lawsuits absolutely and it's just the cost of doing business, I guess. It's just, it's just the cost of doing business. Yep. <clears throat> yeah, um, is that expensive as I think it is? It is not for physical therapists. Okay. <clears throat> it, it, no, it's for, like I, uh, well, it certainly would, de it depends on the size of your business, but you can uh, usually get a policy for well under $2,000 a year. Okay. Yeah. That's, you know, that's and sometimes much less than it's, yeah, it's not like it's not like uh, physician I, insurance. Yeah, I, I was thinking like two, four, five thousand dollars a month or something. Yeah, no, like no, 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 no. Physicians really have that issue, and it's one of the, um, <clears throat> you know, it, it, it's a it it's drives up their costs dramatically. Yeah, so I'm very intrigued by this content platform you're gonna do. Let's talk about that some more. So like, oh, hey, so like, have you decided what you're gonna are you gonna build your own platform? Or are you gonna put on something else, somebody else's platform, or how's that gonna work? Well, right now I'm doing, I uh, use Kajabi to manage the back end of my website. So I'm just going to, I'm starting by doing it just with Kajabi. Okay. <clears throat> and so, and I have three levels to it. And the first one, <clears throat> I, well, one of the things that I say, which is that's, so is that, you know, we are literally made of stardust. You know, and quite literally, like we know that scientifically, we are. There's, I've uh, collected a number of articles about about that. You know, we are literally made of stardust, and our stardust has a story. So I created uh, stardust levels. So the stardust zone is for um, just extra blog and podcast 
content, meditations, guided imageries, things like that, all designed to really uh, to, to help your vagus nerve function better and to bridge, you know, work with your vagus nerve as the bridge between your story and your body. But it's not, but it's, uh, uh, and it all, like, in, all the levels include one vagus nerve, like live vagus nerve class per month with me. So the, the Stardust Zone is just a basic vagus nerve class that I'm going to teach every month. And then the, uh, the next level up is, uh, going to have a more advanced vagus nerve class and access to office scheduling office hours online with me and potentially in person too if i had enough people here locally to make that um for that to work i'm open to that as well and then to have a higher level for professional for, for professionals for medical professionals and um mind body wellness experts to really uh get some teaching you you know and that's really a level for me to teach my material at the professional level on an ongoing basis and then there is an additional optional certification pathway for those professionals in that aspect that want to uh, pursue a deeper dive into the training and really how to use it with um, their patients and clients at a deeper level so um, when you see you have to be able to have all this done, like six months, two months, you have like a goal? Set oh, it's a, well, I'm, I'm launching it this weekend because I'm teaching okay. a class this weekend in collaboration, oh, in collaboration with a uh, 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 neuro performance expert. And so I'm going to, yeah, so I'm going to announce it there. So if you, uh, I don't have the details up at this second, but if you go, uh, there will be more information at embodyyourstar.com. If you want to get on my email list, I'll be sending all of that out. And the plan is just to, is to really build the content and keep the focus on live content. I'm not really like, I'll maintain a library of things for a little while, but I think that I really want to keep the content fresh and new and, um, and I want to know what people want. You know, I created a question and answer platform so people can ask me questions and I'll create a podcast style response out of that. And so I'm really excited to offer that and, uh, and more and really grow this into a bigger, um, you know, in, into a bigger media empire. So, you know, but to also be very accessible. Yeah, that sounds all very exciting, Melanie. Thank you. Thank you. I'm really excited about it. Melanie, is there anything that I should have asked you that, that I did not ask you? Oh, hmm. well, I'll just, uh, I'll just recap maybe a little bit that, you know, when I talk about those archetypal, uh, compression points are like where your heroics and your desires are at odds with each other, that those really do treating the story, you know, or the physical expression of the cosmos and story in the body really transforms vagus nerve function. So it's all very, very connected. And your vagus nerve is very much like the mycelium network of your body and the mycelium network of the earth connects all the plants and trees together and sends out shunts nutrients and sends out warning signals. And it's also very much like the Laniakea supercluster of the sky of which our Milky Way galaxy is one little teeny tiny part. So it's really that uh, connection to as above, so below. And um, I just, it, like, it's really, it's working with the same thing on a, on a bigger, on a bigger con continuum, but the stronger your vagus nerve is and the more you can, um, the more it's allowed to flow, the more uh, knowledge, wisdom, magic, and truth show up in your life. Melanie, understand you have something for our listeners today. I do. I do. If you go to embodyyourstar.com, you will and enter your email. It will send you those, uh, the vagus nerve classes that I mentioned earlier, as well as some other uh, 
bonuses. There's a handout to um, for uh, the uh, different body parts. So you can kind of look at what story goes with what part of the body you might have problems with. There's a an infographic for the vagus nerve compression points that includes the heroics and desires and works down their uh, six major compression points that I discussed. And so there's a whole bunch of goodies that you get on that opt-in page and, um, and you'll get all the latest updates for all the new things that I'm doing as well. Melanie, can you share your social media links for yourself and your company so people can reach out to you? Yes. Yes. My social media is all embody your star. So Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, it's at embody your star. It's under my name, but the handle social media handle is embody your star. And to a listener who has a link to her gift on social media on the show notes, you can find the show notes at www.kevinshtlblog.com. Be sure to subscribe to the Kevin to, to the Jason Kevin's experience and share this with your friends. And also a reminder, my company, Kevin's HR, is doing a crowdfunder right now. So please donate at https kevinshr.co slash crowdfunding. Melanie, we'll come to the end of our talk. Can you give us any wisdom or advice or anything you want to talk about? Hmm. I'll just circle back to that South American proverb that your future is behind you, propelling you forward and your past is in front of you, waiting for you to make peace with it and clear your way. And uh, to really just lean into this idea that your future has your back. Melanie, thank you for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me, Jason. The little girl that wasn't allowed to use her voice uh, <laughs> heals more and more every time she gets to. So I really appreciate you sharing your platform with me. Yes. And to our listeners, thank you for your time as well. And remember to be great every day.